Well, good evening, and welcome to uh, our last chapter of the book of the story. Uh, this is not going to be our last session. I'm going to come back next week, and I want to uh, just do kind of a, a wrap-up of this whole uh, long series, uh, and, and again remind us of some of the general concepts that we've used in this conversation to talk about how we read the Bible and what the Bible says and, and how we read it well and why it's important for us to have the whole picture, right? To have the, the 30,000 foot picture, the whole arc of the story and how that sort of sets us up to understand better uh, what it is that we're, uh, we're, what it is that all, how it is that all the pieces fit together as well. But we are at the final chapter anyway that is in the book itself and that's chapter 31 which is called The End of Time, appropriately, I suppose. And uh, chapter 31, of course, uh, brings us to the final book in the, in the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation. Uh, and uh, a, a great book to talk about, a highly misunderstood book, a terribly abused book, uh, and a great place for us to once again have this conversation about the difference between just quoting things out of the Bible and actually hearing the word of the God in uh, hearing the word of God in the Bible, uh, because it is a great book. Uh, while yeah, it's dense and and it seems that it's complicated. The truth is, is that it's really wonderful and in very many ways uh, is the heart of the gospel message itself. And, and 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 getting to that place really means first of all that we need to understand this word, the apocalypse. Right? That's the word that we come to. That is the actual title of the book, The Apocalypse. But apocalypse does not mean disaster or calamity. Uh, it does not mean the end. The word apocalypse means revelation. That's why the book is called Revelation. It is a revealing. It lets us know something. It's not uh, meant to be mysterious. It's not meant to be secretive. There is no hidden message in it that some will know and some will not. It's meant, in fact, to tell us something. And if we come at it with that understanding, then I think we're going to come at it with a much different sort of experience. So thinking about this word apocalypse, which is not an uncommon word in the New Testament especially, but he, you know, here are a few examples of it, right? In Luke 2, uh, this is the Song of Simeon, uh, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. Uh, and this is how Paul uses the term here in Galatians. I did not receive it, the gospel that is, from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, and again, Paul talking about the gospel. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed. In other words, God has made this known and is attested by the law and by the prophets. It's not a secret. And that, that probably is the first thing that we want to say about the book of Revelations is it's not there to be kept, uh, to, to keep some sort of secret from us. It's meant to tell us something. And that's how it describes itself, by the way. Right here is how the book starts. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, that is John, to show his servants what must take place. What must take soon, what must soon take place. We'll come back to those words. He had made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Right? No, no secrets, no tricks. This word is what it is. This, this writing is, is meant to tell us something so that we can understand the gospel. We can understand Jesus so that we can see something. Uh, so that's the first thing, right? This whole notion of a hidden word, uh, of secret things that only a few will understand, and most will be left behind all of the ways that the book is read and interpreted go against the very nature of the book itself. It's meant to be understood. Which sort of begs the question, well then how do we understand it? Right, I mean it is an interesting piece of literature. Is it a highly interesting writing? And that means that we gotta have our interpretive tools out, we gotta have our hats, our thinking heads on, and, and we gotta pay attention. And so we always begin again with this question, well what is the context? 
right? What did the word mean to those who first heard it? What, how is it set? And, and to get that firmly in our hands so that when we read forward, we're reading with some integrity uh, and, and some honesty and not just making stuff up. It, it is a prophetic writing. Uh, let's say that first of all. It's not an historical writing. Uh, it is meant to be a prophecy. It, it's a unique kind of prophecy in that it is a little bit more like some of the latter prophetic writings, more like Daniel, uh, more like Ezekiel, and some of the other intertestamental books as well. But it's still a prophecy, and it still follows the rules of all of the prophets, which means that it is an interpretation of what's going on in the world, not a prediction. Right? This is not Gene Dixon. This is not us peeking into our crystal balls to see what the future holds. The prophets tell the people what's going on right now and where that is leading, where the current path is going to take us. There's no trick to it. There's no secret ending. What they're trying to point out to the people is this is obvious, right? You're doing this and this will be the outcome. And, and that should be clear. Now, for sure in prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, the, the word of the prophet is, hey, you are not being faithful to God. You are not being faithful to the covenant. This is going to lead to disaster. This is going to lead to doom and destruction for you. Here, the prophecy is a slightly different because what, what the prophet in Revelation is telling us is, hey, life is really hard right now, but, but because of the gift of God in Jesus Christ, because of the life, because of the resurrection, this is good leading to something else. And, and not to lose those words we heard from that first chapter, this is about to take place. This is soon to take place. It's going to be, uh, it, it's about to be birth. It's coming even among you right now. And that's a terribly important uh, part of the word. The other thing to remember about prophetic writings is that they are for the most part poetry. Right? They are not prose. Uh, they're not instruction. They're not science. And so the appeal of prophecy is not to the head, it's to the heart. These are words that are meant to be felt and to be experienced and not just meant to be academically or intellectually devoured and digested and torn apart. And so that's part of the, of, of the thing of reading uh, of just the, the incredible rich uh, writing here, the, the symbols and the imagery, is it's meant to be almost fantastic. Not fantastic in the sense of fantasy, but fantastic in the sense of it's meant to take us into a different space spiritually. It's meant to touch us in a much deeper way and not just meant simply to be read. So that's, that's the first piece of context is that this is a prophecy uh, and not just any kind of writing. Uh, this is a book written to a community undergoing persecution. Uh, persecution in the first century is intermittent, uh, but it is definitely there, stronger in some parts of the world than others. But it's obvious that this particular writing is meant to address those who are facing great trial and suffering on account of their identity as the followers of Jesus. And, and so in that sense, you know, what do you tell people who are undergoing such terrible persecution except hang in there, be faithful. There is a, a, a better end to this story. Your suffering and pain is not the last word here. God is up to something. You will be vindicated. You will be rewarded. And so the book very much is about this daily battle that the faithful are experiencing and it is a word of encouragement and it is a word of hopefulness. That's the piece we never want to lose when we read the book of Revelation. It is not a book about doom and gloom for the followers of Jesus. It is a book about being hopeful because they will be rescued, because they will be saved, because they will be redeemed, and, and this will all turn out uh, for the good, uh, for God's plan, uh, and not just because the world is a terrible place. One other important piece to the context, and that's the idea of symbolism. The book is terribly symbolic, richly symbolic. Not as uh, a way to keep secrets, because the symbols are obvious in the context of the first century. And this is, again, you know, not uh, uh, Nostradamus uh, writing things that will maybe take place in a couple of millennia. Uh, these are symbols that are quite clear 
to the early church. They know what 666 means. They know who the beast is. That makes perfectly good sense to them. Now that you and I would take those understandings and try to gain some perspective in our own world, that's a different question. But to try to try to use those symbols as a way to uh, somehow unlock some mystery happening here in the year 2022, that's an abuse of, of the text. And that's not how it meant to be. Let me give you an example here. You know this symbol, right? This is the ichthys, the symbol of the fish, a common symbol in the apostolic community. It was a way that they marked a place so that Others in the community knew that that was a place that they gathered. That was a place where they either had been or were going to be, and so that people could find them. And that's really the key, right? That symbol was meant to be there so that people would know what it is and so that people could find something. Not meant to hide anything, quite the opposite. It was meant to, to be clear. Uh, it was meant to be um, transparent. And so the symbolism in the book of Revelation is in its own way transparent too. Though it comes to us across two millennia, it still made perfectly good sense in its day. And so we need to do the same. We, we need to take the sense of those symbols from their day and, and not somehow abuse them by trying to apply them to our, our current situation. Um, there is a truth here that we can bring forward. But it's not a literal truth that we're going to find in the symbols. Not some hidden mystery we're going to play Indiana Jones and uncover. Um, the truth is greater than that. And again, I think the truth is in the poetry. The truth is in the emotions that it provokes and, and the feelings as well. So, you know, how do we, how, how, so the other thing that we want is we want to have some tools, right? If we're going to uh, uh, wander into this book and we're going to really get uh, the beauty of this book. There are a couple of tools that we can use to help us stay on the path and not let us wander too deep into the, uh, into the unusual qualities of this writing as well. One is um, we're going to talk about the plain sense of the text. Now that may seem a little counterintuitive to the book of Revelation which seems to have nothing plain about it. Right, but, but the thing is, is that we're not going to wander too far away from what it actually says. So we're going to see the symbols, we're going to hear them as they were heard in that first and second centuries, and we're going to just take them as, the, as they're brought to us, they are presented to us, as they are described to us. Uh, we're not going to uh, search for deeper hidden meanings that don't actually exist. We're going to read the book as it is. We're going to look for this word of law and gospel as Luther taught us. We're going to understand that yes, in fact, God condemns things that are unfaithful. God uh, is mad uh, about injustice. By the way, there is a significant theme of injustice, of inequity, that also plays through the book of Revelation, even in this uh, rather fantastic symbolic depiction as well. There is still a word here about uh, economic inequity and, and about the practice of injustice as well. Right? So, so we're going to hear those words and we're going to hear them as law. But we're also going to hear the gospel, which is so loud and clear in the book of Revelation. This idea uh, of salvation by grace, of a God of mercy, of a God who redeems uh, those whom he loves, cannot be missed. It is so obvious. So we're going to hear both of those words and we're going to take each of them as they are. We're not going to confuse the two. We're not going to let the word of law scare us away so that we do not hear this word of God's love. The other tool that we're going to use is we're going to remember that scripture interprets scripture. So we're not going to read the book of Revelation apart from the whole of the scripture, the whole canon of scripture. It's not its own part. And so we're going to use what we have gained over the entirety of the Bible and all of the books in the Bible. We're going to use those truths to help us understand this book better too. It's not its own thing. It is a part of a whole and, and has to function as a part of a whole. One other tool that I want to give you that I think is really the kind of the key part is a strange word. A new word maybe for your vocabulary. It's a Greek word, eschatology. Eschatology uh, is about the end, times, about something that is breaking into the current time. 
And I don't want to get all meta metaphysical here with you, and I don't want to go too deep into philosophy. But what is uh, clear in the thinking uh, of Paul, uh, in the words of the uh, Old Testament prophets, and in the book of Revelation, and everywhere, is that we are not talking about a picture of a distant future that will come just simply at an end of time, whatever we think that that means. The book of Revelation, like the entirety of the Bible, speaks of a kingdom of God that is coming into reality even now. There is no sense of if it will come. It might happen. Maybe if we're good, this will happen. The idea of the kingdom of God is that God has already determined that this has been established. This is the reality that underlies within what we think is real. I always like to, to think about um, the movie The Matrix, um, which is such an interesting movie, but there's this great notion in the book of, of uh, in the movie The Matrix that that there is the reality as people experience it, and then there is the reality. Uh, and, and the greater reality people don't know because they're being fed this computer program that, that they tend to think is reality. That's what eschatology is. Eschatology is this idea that we don't actually know what's real. The revelation of God is what's real. And it challenges us to think about our world and our reality in a different way and to see underneath it something greater, something bigger, something way more important. Which brings me to the two word summary of the book of Revelation. It seems like an enormously complicated book, and yeah, we could teach on it for weeks upon weeks because there's a lot of great stuff here. But the truth is, in the end, uh, that the book of Revelation is about one simple thing that we can summarize in two words, God wins. The book of Revelation is about this constant battle between being faithful and the tug of a world that has a much different idea about values and about morals and about how people should live and what success means and how we should be. God's vision of, of life, God's vision of what is good and right, that's what wins in the end. This idea of mercy, uh, this idea of redeeming grace, those are the things that triumph. And, 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 and for the faithful, the message is wait and see. Wait and see what God is up to. This is how the book ends. These may be in their own way some of the most important verses in the Bible. It says, this is at the end. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. This is the whole and the great gift of this book. right? This, this amazing picture that... that in the end, and not just in the end chronologically, but this reality that, that is the end of our reality, our suffering, our struggling, is this promise, this beautiful picture of a God who is present to us, of, of no more crying and no more suffering and no more pain. And, and the book of Revelation is there to ask us uh, what it would mean to live as if that were true today. What would it mean for us to live in that light? And, and to see ourselves and to see our world and, and to make choices and to do things and to treat our neighbors according to that truth, according to that promise. Too often we take it for granted uh, the way that the world is. And, and too often we play along with all of the brokenness of this world and all of the bad things of this world because we assume that's how it is and how it's supposed to be. But, but Revelation asks us a much different question. Revelation says, this is Jesus. This is the God who made all things. This is your God. And, and this is his truth. And what would it mean for you to be faithful to that truth? 
in the way that you approach life every single day. You see, that's the revelation, uh, that there is more to the world and more to us than meets the eye. And for us to open our eyes and open our hearts and look through our faith and see everything differently, and, and in that, then the truth will be revealed to us. One last thought about the book of Revelation. We think of it as the end. Too often we read it as if it is about an end and whatever these things that will come at an end of time, whatever that might be or mean or when that might happen. Um, but it also is an end in the sense that it's the end of the scriptures, right? It is probably the latest piece of writing that has been included in the canonical scriptures. And so it sits at the back of our Bible. But is it the end? I mean, is this the last revelation of God? I think that's a yes and no question. And, and I want to answer it in this kind of way. One is to say that, that, that no, God is constantly revealing himself to us in so many ways. That we are constantly experiencing God. And, and just because the canon of the Bible, just because the list of books that we include in, in this one book that we call the scriptures has ended and ended centuries ago, it doesn't mean that God is done talking to us. It doesn't mean that God has new things to say. Uh, I, I think that there are as important uh, of voices uh, operating in the world and in the church today as they were 2,000 years ago and well worth listening to. At the same time, this is the last word of God. This idea that God wins in the end, that his promise, his truth triumphs over all things, that's the end of everything. The end of the story has been written. Too often I think we live out our faith as if that was not so, as if things were still up in the air, as if we have no idea how this is going to turn out. Uh, you know, as if somehow we still had control of, of the process and the journey and its destination. Revelation uh, is a reminder to the saints of the first century, as much as it is a reminder to us, that God has these things under control. This is his world. And it, life is playing out as God intends it to play out. It may not seem like that within every moment of every day. Understand that. We're not just puppets uh, somehow being manipulated by God at some greater reality. But we are the ones who belong to that kingdom. We are the ones who belong to that truth. And, and that truth determines how we see everything. That truth determines uh, the effect uh, of everything that we do. That truth shapes the world as it is. And we are called to be a part of that truth. Uh, we are not the ones who made the world and we are not the ones who will end it. That's what the book of Revelation has come to tell us. God will end the world in his way and in his time. He will bring about the fulfillment of this amazing promise that was incarnate in a man named Jesus and that was fulfilled on a day that we call Easter. And everything that happens uh, between then and whenever is just simply a playing out of that same story. Revelation tells that story in, in a fascinating and, and different kind of way, but in that sense, it absolutely brings together everything that the whole of the book of the Bible has been trying to tell us about this love, God of love and grace. Uh, so I commend it to your reading uh, and to your study. And, and at any time you want to talk more about it, I invite you to reach out and contact me and, and we will get into it because it's quite fun. So I invite you to join me again next Wednesday night at six o'clock. I'll have one last uh, reflection for you on what the whole of the Bible is and, and uh, what hopefully we've learned from this long journey uh, and, uh, and, and how that will help you as you go back now into the scriptures and it becomes a regular part uh, of your life of faith. God bless and have a really great evening.